what can you tell us about semen analysis? Is it worthwhile? Who and when? Who and and why should a man kind of consider it? Yeah, this is, this is a great question because semen analysis is again not a perfect test for fertility. It just tells us physician what's the likelihood of a patient conceiving naturally, right? So it's think about it as a snapshot in time that would give you the quality and the quantity of sperm. The main question we're trying to answer is, do you have enough sperm who would swim from the vagina to the cervix, to the uterus, to the tube, to meet the egg and fertilize an egg? And the only way to know is to test the sperm. The good news is for men, it's super easy. It's just like, you go, you provide the sample, which mm. is not the best, the there's worst a few, thing ever. There's, there's, a, there's a few yeah. steps involved in, exactly. in how you collect that sample. It, it's Let, not leave it the to worst there. experience ever, though, compared to female, <laughs> right. where if you want to test the, the female fertility, it's a whole different process. They have It's probably a, a week of testing and imaging modalities and hormones and, and blood work. And it's, it's way more painful for a female to test the fertility versus a man, which is a simple one-time test that you can do and we can get a lot of information out of this test. So basically, a semen analysis would give me the volume of the sperm. How much sperm do you have in this ejaculate? It will give you the concentration. How many sperm do you have per volume, per ml? We'll call it million per ml of sperm. And then it will give me a quality of the sperm. What's the ability of the sperm to swim, which is the motility of the sperm? And how does the sperm look? Does it have one head, one tail, all the measurements are good? Or do they have sperm with two heads or two tails or a short neck? And this is well, the morphology. What's optimal, what's optimal when so it comes optimal, to... So we have a, the, a reference range that's set by the WHO, the World Health Organization, and we have the sixth edition. They give us a reference range, meaning that they got around 4,000 men who are fertile. They did an average. And they said, if a patient is testing their sperm and they're above the fifth percentile, of all of these men, they're considered normal. They're considered to have a normal fertility potential. So we have specific numbers. For concentration, it has to be more than 15 million per ml. For uh, volume, more than 1.5 ml. For motility, more than 40% of the sperm that are swimming. So once we get this test, we don't look at one individual parameter. No, because presumably that 40% is directly affected by like the total count. Correct. This is a, a great point. So once you get this, this sperm test, you should not focus on one parameter. This is why we, we, we divide something called the total motile sperm count. It's basically a compounded number on how many sperm do you have able to swim up to meet the egg and fertilize it. And it's, it's a number you can calculate by multiplying volume times concentration times motility. So if you multiply like the 1.5, by let's say concentration of 15 million by 0 0.4, you'll get this TMC, we call it, it's a TMC number. And once this number is more than 20 million, then I look at this number and I tell the patient, you know what, at this point, you shouldn't have major problem conceiving naturally. If the number is lower, then we have to tell the patient, you know what, this number is a bit lower than the reference range. Maybe it's a better idea to dig deep and see if there is any correctable reason on why these numbers are, are lower than the reference range. And you mentioned at the outset that we don't really understand how these numbers have changed over time, over decades. We think they're going down. We don't know why exactly. So we know that 50 years ago, the concentration and the total motile sperm count were higher than that. The 50% figure is controversial. Like some scientists say this is not accurate, it cannot be 50% because if, if the progression continues in 2050, no one will have sperm. Like that if you decline another 50% in 50 years, some, some scientists say like every single couple are gonna need IVF in 2050. So that's like, like a doomsday. Uh, that's a little alarmist. It is, it is. We think it's, it's somewhere in the, in the middle, but we admit that, and we acknowledge that there is a decline. And this decline is, mostly driven by lifestyle and environmental factor. So what we're exposed to and what we do actually is clearly affecting sperm and germ cell production in our bodies. This episode is proudly brought to you by 38 Terra. Try 38 Terra's DMN Prebiotic, the science-based daily multivitamin for your gut microbes. 
a simple and delicious way to take your gut health to the next level. Now back in stock in new and improved packaging for customers living in the United States, Australia, and New Zealand. Get 10% off your DMN at 38terra.com using the code THEPROOF. That's 38TERA.com and use the coupon code THEPROOF for 10% off. Is there a top three? And we'll, we'll, we'll walk through that list. But if you were to say, you know, these are the top three things for the, the dude listening yeah. or perhaps the, the female partner listening who's going to pass on this information, top three things that would explain why these semen parameters are uh, becoming sort of more and more suboptimal. So I would say one of the top three is exposure to toxins, environmental pollution, and uh, pesticides and, and plastics. So we know for a fact, like it's scientifically proven that these molecules are absorbed into the cellular level, molecular level, and that they're affecting the function of the sperm and production of the sperm. So they're affecting the actual quality and quantity, but also the ability of the sperm to fertilize the neck. The problem is it's everywhere around us. Like everything we're touching, right. everything we're breathing. Even condoms. Everything. <laughs> everything. Even condoms. <laughs> but we don't want condoms for fertility, right? right? So this is good. Right. But everything that we're exposed to, everything that we eat, has some sort of, of contaminant, whether it's, it's bisphenol A, BPA, or BPS, or phthalate, or heavy metals. And these are clearly a factor in the decline and dysfunction of the sperm. So you should be very conscious and aware, especially in a period where you're trying to conceive. Like, if you're not trying to conceive, you know what, just live your life, be healthy. But if, if you're trying to conceive, you have to start thinking and guiding your life into a more healthy well-being. So you have to think about what you're eating, how you're exercising, how you're sleeping, your stress level. You have to be conscious about these factors because they do affect your fertility potential. They do affect semen parameter. What if you had a patient in front of you who said, okay, well, you know, we live in this world. <laughs> what, are, what are the best ways for me to kind of... Uh, reduce my exposure to those environmental yeah. toxins without without you know just locking yourself up yeah. indoors uh, I, my spiel in, in clinic is is divided into three three parts the first part is anything that's healthy for you is healthy for your sperm so think about if if you eat well like a good mediterranean diet or a fish omega-3 uh green stuff no added sugar no processed foods uh, this is going to be good for sperm Anything that uh, increases the temperature around your scrotum is bad. So excessive hot tub, jacuzzis, saunas. If you put your laptop on your laps for extended period of time, this is going to have heat on the testicle. This is bad. What about phone in the pocket? It's controversial. So some studies are saying that these uh, radiomagnetic waves have some, have some side effect on sperm. We don't have a solid evidence saying that there is a correlation between cell phone use or putting your cell phone in your back pocket or front pocket and semen abnormalities. We have some, some studies here and there saying there might be a correlation. Again, it's very important to understand that correlation is not causation, right? Uh, and then the third category is anything in excess is bad. So excessive alcohol consumption, uh, smoking is extremely bad. Uh, Marijuana, recreational drug, is, is also bad. Marijuana is, is, again, controversial. We had some studies proving that it has no effect whatsoever on semen parameter and semen function. Newer studies are showing that marijuana itself has, has no side effect. However, the chemical composition of marijuana is very similar to estrogen. So when people are smoking weed or like in doing uh, uh, edibles, there is a higher concentration of estrogen versus testosterone in your body. And this is going to lead to sperm dysfunction. It's not the actual marijuana. It's like just because the, the molecule looks like estrogen. And this is what's causing these problems. So these things like cannabis or jacuzzi or, or sauna, yeah. what parameter are, are they, what semen parameter are they affecting? Is so it they're motility? affecting mostly the quality. So okay. the morphology and the motility of the sperm. So shape and, and, and what the, percentage the of swimming? Correct. Correct. Okay. And where does uh, kind of sperm DNA damage come into this this story? Is it's, that is that distinct again? 
it's it's a separate from the quality and and the quantity of the sperm. So you have quality of the sperm, quantity of the sperm, and then the DNA integrity. Like how healthy is the DNA inside of the sperm? So the only function of the sperm is to deliver DNA into the egg, right? We don't have again great ways to check how healthy is DNA. Is it like the best DNA you can have with no mutation, like really clean, that's gonna swim and 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 go into the egg? There's something called a DNA fragmentation test, which is again a, a, a indirect test to give us an idea on how much stress is the sperm undergoing. We call it like oxidative stress. Is this is the sperm under a lot of pressure and tension, and you can feel that the 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 DNA itself is not stable, and you have a lot of breakup and mutation in there. This is shown by the DNA fragmentation test. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't do that that test. I don't think it was part of the the sperm test that I did. It is so. So legacy is the only at home mailing kit that would offer this because usually it's a very complicated test to perform. Uh, but they were they were able to to do it through the same kit. If, if you have normal semen parameters, it's unlikely for you to have bad DNA. They usually, they go hand in hand. Like if you have good sperm, good quality, good quantity, there is no reason why the DNA should be affected, right? Usually it's, they just follow, the trend follows each other. Jacuzzi and sauna, what's the mechanism here? Are they, are they just literally heating the sperm up so it much is, they're, they're just cooking it? They're frying the sperm. So and it just dies. Think, it doesn't die, it, it's, going to be affected so think about why the testicle sits in the sack because they need a cooler temperature compared to the internal body temperature so it's it's two degrees less than the internal body temperature so when you expose these testicles sitting in the sack to high heat you're going to increase the temperature back right this is like you're, you're defying nature i think, I think i've seen on a, on a reddit uh, <laughs> yeah. a reddit forum and I certainly wouldn't recommend people get medical advice on Reddit, but I saw, <laughs> I saw a few people talking about uh, they didn't want to give up their sauna and they decided to go into the sauna with an ice pack. <laughs> ice pack. <laughs> I mean, and this is, again, the, what you should, or what I do is I, I do respect the wishes of, of patients. Like when, when they come to my office, I'm not trying to torture them. Like if someone comes here and say, you know what, sauna is my number one priority. It's part of my well-being and my ritual. I don't want to give it up. We can work something whereby I say, how about you do it less often? How about you stop it for a couple of weeks before you're trying to conceive? Because the sperm cycle is 74 days. So every three months, you have a new batch of sperm being produced and ejaculated. So the test that you did was a reflection of what happened three months ago. So if you're trying and planning to conceive, let's say in six months, maybe just the three months or so before this date, you can try to modify how many times you're going to the sauna, how much you're spending in there. It's, it's all about moderation. Like if you go there maybe two times a week for 10 minutes, this is not going to be bad. If you go there and sit for an hour every day, you're going to have your sperm factor. And is this something that you think all men who are sort of planning to have children should be thinking about or is this more reserved for the bucket of people who are having difficulty conceiving so you can think about it in two ways if you're a man trying to conceive and you did a baseline semen analysis and you don't have any abnormalities your numbers are in the millions then you have a bit more of a room of a leeway right there is a buffer there so you have like some some leeway to go and, and do some bad stuff for your sperm if you're a man trying to conceive, but they don't want to do a semen parameter, they, they have to optimize every single factor they can control, including the exposure to heat, including the smoking, including a, a, a good sleep, less stress, exercising a couple of times per week. All of these factors, again, are good for your health. And because they're good for your health, they're going to be good for sperm production. Right. And, they, and back to the life cycle being 74 days. Correct. If you start, if you make these lifestyle changes today, it's going to take 74 days exactly. until those changes have had a full effect exactly. on the quality and amount of sperm 100%. And this is the same for any medication that we give these patients or any surgery. Or if they're taking testosterone replacement therapy, you have to, and we'll talk about this hopefully later, anything that you change today, it needs at least one to two sperm cycle for you to see the effects. 
So oh, if, so you if, might even allow 148 days. Correct. So up to six months. It's 2025 and I have made the decision to join Function Health to help monitor and optimize my health. And honestly, after getting set up, I am wondering what took me so long. Function makes it extremely easy to track important biometric information over a lifetime. Information that you can use in real time to make important health decisions. Function gives you over 100 lab tests covering your entire body every year. Heart, hormones, liver, kidneys, thyroid, metabolic health, heavy metals, autoimmunity, nutrients, and more. Five times more testing than your typical physical for $499 a year. A lot cheaper than if you were to order all of these tests individually. That's if you can order them. Take ApoB and LP little a, for example, two very important tests for determining your risk of having a heart attack or stroke. Yet, as outlined in multiple episodes on this show by Dr. Thomas Dayspring, they can be incredibly difficult to order with your local doctor. Using Function is very straightforward. You join and then visit one of their 2000 US lab locations. I went to one here in LA where I live. It's very easy and boom, your results are tracked over time in one secure place. No shady upselling, no gimmicks, just your results, beautiful presented and science-based insights from doctors to help you optimize your health. Skip the 400,000 person wait list today at functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill and join me on the path to nerd level health optimization. That's functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill.